they went across the lake to the region of the Gerizines. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus was saying to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Hey, happy Mother's Day Fellowship, and to all our mothers out there, we are so thankful for you, no matter what season that you are in, whether you are a new mom, or you're an empty nester, or maybe you're a grandmother. And man, in these times, if you're a mom with small children, then may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you strength and give you patience. I know this has got to be a hard time, and, and you're going to need a lot of patience. And look, when it comes to Mother's Day, too, we know... That is not only a great happy time, but it can be a grieving time for others as well. And maybe you're someone who has wanted to be a mom, and for some reason you're unable to get pregnant. And we just, we grieve with you. We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we grieve with those who grieve. And I wish we could understand all of God's ways and why certain things happen and other things don't. But something, somebody said something to me a long time ago that, that is really, I think it's more, it's more than just a cliche. But it says when we can't see God's hand, we can trust his heart. And I know that we can trust his heart on this one. And I just pray that you would experience his presence today, specifically today, because I know that it can be so hard. Well, as we turn to Mark 5, the beginning part of Mark 5 this week, this passage is a doozy. I mean, this is a passage where we have probably the most vivid description of a spiritual exorcism in the scriptures. And certainly it's not something that we see every day. And even in looking at it, sometimes we, it can create more questions than answers for us. And, and I'm hoping in our time together today that, that we can just identify this spiritual reality because we just don't talk about it that much. And, and really, the scriptures don't talk about demons in that that often. I mean, it gives us a little bit, but it doesn't talk about it that often. And I think there's a reason for it. And Paul seems to really link into it in the last part of Romans, in his letter to the Roman church. And in Romans chapter 16, he says this, I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. In other words, I want to have you less 
preoccupation with demons and, and more preoccupation with God. Because really, what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. And so the more the light comes into something, the more it exposes it, and the darkness actually has to flee. And so we want to bring the light of Jesus in on this subject. And so in this passage, there's really three scenes, if you will, that will be the context uh, of where I want to go this morning. And, and we'll just touch on each one of them briefly and have some questions interspersed that you can pause and look at as we go through. Now, but the, here are the three. Uh, there's a man being tortured by an impure spirit, which we'll talk about the reality of the spiritual world there. Then there's the confrontation with Jesus. This is really the climactic part where we'll talk about what it means to believe. And then there's a life exchange where we'll really begin to look at our own hearts. So let's just start with this man being tortured by an impure spirit. And and when we read a passage like this, I think one of the first questions that comes to mind for us, uh, I know it did for me early on, is, oh my gosh, this is really um, amazing and kind of scary. And I'm wondering, can a Christian be demon-possessed? And I want to give you an emphatic no. No, there is no way that an, an impure spirit can be in the same person that the Spirit of God dwells. So absolutely not. And in fact, Romans six fourteen tells us this, is for sin will no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So if you're meaning by a Christian, someone who has surrendered their life to Christ and is a growing relationship with them, then absolutely not. But if by a Christian, you mean someone who is kind of a cultural Christian and just kind of goes to church and doesn't really change their life. They just kind of go through the motions and it's just kind of they, they've maybe prayed a prayer sometime in their life and think that they're good to go. Then I would say they don't have any kind of assurance here. But I think the other thing that we need to really be careful of here is this whole term of demon possession. It's unfortunate because I think in the NIV and in different translations and English translations, they, they've taken this word, this Greek word, uh, which is daimenosai. And what they've done is they've translated it to be possession. So demon possession. When really it's more demonic influence is what it means. Demonic influence. And, what there's, and there's a difference between the two. And so I think when we think possession... We're thinking of someone who no longer can exercise their own will and are under complete, total influence by a demon. And there are some extreme cases of this, our passage today being one of them. But this isn't normative. This is, this is an extreme example of what goes on. And, and hopefully we'll get some understanding here as we go a little bit further. So we need to think more in, in terms of demonic influence. Because I'll help it in the long run. And no doubt, this guy was definitely influenced by many demons. In fact, when we look at this, he lived out in the caves. He lived in a place that was outside the city, kind of a place where outcasts lived. In the tombs, it was called, where people who were even were buried or caves that you could live in for any kind of outcast that didn't know what to do. What we see in the passage is obviously this thing gained strength on him because at one time they could chain him up. They chained him by the ankles and by the hands, but he broke out of those and now no one could subdue him anymore. So it's almost like he gained supernatural strength in this whole thing and and, and no one could subdue subdue him and and he would cry out night and day. And and you can just imagine how this was just um, irritating and, and bothersome and And so right off, what this passage does, I think, is it confronts some of our spiritual assumptions uh, about the spiritual world. And so I just wanted to remind us of a few things this morning that I think are important for us if we're going to live a victorious Christian life. We need to understand enough about the spiritual world. And the first one might seem like a no-brainer. But so many people can deny the fact that there is a spiritual world. So the first thing I want you to know is that spiritual warfare is a reality. It's a reality. In fact, Paul talks about it in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not something we can see. 
but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. I mean, Paul could have just said, look, he could have stopped at part of that. But what he's telling us is there's an ordered structure, even in the unseen world, in the evil world. And, and there are demons who are in charge of demons and who are in charge of other ones and, and against all these powers and f- spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, the other day, I was driving down BB Caps and I had a truck in front of me and his exhaust was just spewing out smoke. I mean, it was just, it was just really bad. I mean, it was just like this smoking car going down the road. It wasn't on fire or anything, but you could just tell he needs to get his engine worked on because there's a lot coming out of here. And it's kind of one of those things where you're driving behind him and you're trying to put space in between him because the exhaust is just kind of coming to your intake and you're like, (coughs) you know, rolling down the windows, trying to do anything. And it was really smoky. And it reminded me of a time when this happened before. And I had a guy with me who was more astute about cars and engines. And and I said, man, look at that. This is so much pollution is coming out here. And he said, well, actually, it's not the stuff that you can see that really is that bad. It's really the things that you can't see. It's the thing, it's the emissions that you can't see that are really a killer that can kill you. And I think this is the same thing that Paul is saying here. Look, it's not the seeing things that are your problem. It's not the people you see. It's not the the governments you see. It's not that really, you know what it really is? The real problem is in the spiritual world. It's in the things you can't see. So there is a spiritual reality, that there is a spiritual world that our eyes have not been open to, and we need to understand that it is part of it. The second thing I need, to, I want us to understand, is just Satan's goal. John put it simply in John ten ten when he said, "The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy." In other words, he wants to keep us from the kingdom of God. And if he's lost us to the kingdom of God, then what he wants to do is he wants to keep us from being influencers or effective in the kingdom of God. Peter also adds in in 1 Peter 5 and says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In other words, he's not passive. He's active. And he is lying and he is tempting and he's doing anything he can to render us ineffective. He wants to oppose the kingdom of God and get people to follow more his will as opposed to God's will. We know his language. John 8 tells us that he's a liar. When he lies, he speaks the native language. For he's a liar and he's the father of lies. In other words, he can't tell the truth. When he brings a thought into your mind or different thing, it's a lie. It's a lie. And and, and he wants this to anchor in and and be something that we'll hang on to and we'll believe. But I think also we need to understand Satan's power is limited. It's limited. We see it a couple ways. In 1 John 4, 4, it says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because in them there is evil spirits because the one who is in you is greater than than the one who is in the world. The one who is in you is greater. And and, and greater here doesn't mean a little bit greater. It means way greater, like out of this universe greater. We also see it in 1 Peter 9. We talked about the first part where it says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. And the next verse he says, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to resist him. Stand firm in the faith. You know, when we think of the difference between the power of God and the power of Satan, I mean, I don't know, I think probably all analogies would break down on this one, but I would think it'd be something along the lines of Mount Everest being God's power and Sugarloaf being the devil's power. And for those of you who are here listening to this and you don't know where we are and where we're doing, uh, Sugarloaf is a a small mountain, a hill really, uh, up in Heber Springs. And so if you compare that to Mount Everest, you're talking about two completely different things here, two different span. So spiritual warfare is real, and he continually wants to tempt us and make us, render us ineffective um, uh, uh, in, in God's kingdom. But there's one more thing that I, that I think is really important for us, and, and that deals more with Satan's influence. 
Notice what it says in 1 John 3, 8, and this is where it'll really come down practically to us. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now, I want to be careful here because not all sin is, is demonic. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the root of all sin comes from the father of sin, Satan. And so in some senses, when we get tempted or when we choose to sin, there's a, there's a demonic influence in there. Now, we're not saying, hey, the devil made me do it. We can't say that. We can't say I don't have anything. You know, I'm not responsible for this. No, the scripture is clear that when we sin, we're responsible. We made the choice. But someone tempts us into that. I mean, take a, a current illustration that really is just happening now and it's hot on the presses and it's just a tragedy but this whole Ahmad Arbery tragedy this this black man who was just running down the road in Georgia and a white man and his son uh, kind of get this idea that maybe it's really racial profiling and and so they go up and they start confronting him and, and they eventually kill him and and you're thinking how in the world does that even get there well they're responsible for it as the judge finally decided, which is good. But how did you even get to that point? And and I'm telling you that there's there's something got put in their mind. Some kind of a sin got thrown in there. They took it. They began to believe it. They began to conjure it up. And then sin took its full fruition. And this tragedy occurs. And, And it doesn't have to be even in that extreme of a case, as bad as that was, Let's take it down to just things that you and I deal with, at least in our world, on a a daily basis. And so, like in Ephesians 4, Paul says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Isn't that interesting? I always found that interesting. Here, what Paul is doing is he's connecting and saying, look, In some way, anger, if it just goes on and on and on, can really, in some way, Satan can use that negatively and and, and push us even further down a destructive road. And it's connected to something simple that you and I deal with, if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and that is anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold. It doesn't get much more plainer than that. There's another way that's something that we deal with every day that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. He says, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And again, he's linking Satan's schemes to unforgiveness. And so he says, look, when when you don't forgive someone, when you're unwilling to forgive, then somehow, in some way, that is an influence, a negative influence that Satan can use to take you down a road of destruction that can destroy relationships, that can destroy families, that can destroy a lot of things. And what we need to understand Now, get this. What we need to understand is the line of good and evil runs through every human heart. Every human heart. In my heart, in your heart, that line of good and evil runs through it. And so really, it's really easy to read this Matthew 5 passage and go, wow, that guy, man, he must have really been off and doing something and, because look how many demons possessed him. And, and, but really, here we need to understand this. The difference between the influence, the demonic influence of this man in Mark 5 and say the demonic influence that may come at me isn't so much in quality. It's the same. But what's different is the quantity. It isn't so much the quality because Satan lies the same to everybody. It isn't the quality of it, but it's more the quantity. And this guy, because he gave into it, and he didn't have the Spirit of God, obviously, then it just continued to pour and we got more and got more, and it influenced him over time. So I want to, let me just, I want you to pause here, 
And I want you to ask a couple, I think, really important questions in real light of this. And they are these. Why is it so important that we understand that we are in a spiritual war? Because it's really important to live victorious. And secondly, how does this understanding change how we live our Christian lives? So not only do we have this man being tortured by an impure spirit, but the second point is, and really the climactic part of the passage, is this confrontation with Jesus. And I want to talk about really here just the whole idea of belief because it's interesting here. When Jesus gets out of the boat, it's not like he seeks out this person who is, has this large demonic influence on him. The guy comes running to Jesus. And it's interesting that what happens is he falls immediately on his knees. Now, he's not worshiping. He just knows whose authority he's under here, and he knows very well, and he knows exactly who he's talking to because he says, Jesus, son of the most high God, and then he begins to beg and to plead, don't torture us. And in Matthew it says, don't torture us until the appointed time. I mean, they even know the day is coming when they will be eliminated forever. But say, don't, don't torture us now. And they're pleading with him. And, you know, and this is interesting. Maybe I've watched too many Avenger movies during this whole isolation thing. But I, I ran through some, um, Caitlin gave me some, the, an order to watch them in. And I've been watching them. And, and it's interesting in all of them. And, and obviously there's spiritual truth and everything. But it isn't like Jesus then is like Thor where he has his hammer and he's just turning this thing around and it's gaining momentum and he just throws it and there's power that explodes and all that. He's not like Dr. Strange where he just is moving his hands and he's creating this time warp where you can jump out of that time zone and into another. No, Jesus just simply says, come out of him. That's it. Come out of him. And there are multiple demons here. He asks them his name. He says it's legion, which in the Roman uh, Empire, a, a legion was a, a cohort of about 5,000 to 6,000 soldiers. So when we want to say this guy had a demonic influence, there were many. And what is interesting is they believe he is the Son of God. They believe he is the Lord. They believe he has all power. They believe that they have no say over his. But all this belief is just merely head knowledge. It's just head knowledge about him, but didn't ever result in a heart change. It didn't result in humility that steps off the throne of your own life and, and puts Jesus on the throne of your life. And here's what I want to say to this. We must not believe the same way the devil does. Don't let your faith be the same faith that the devil has, which is just merely an intellectual assent to something without a submission to it, without a heart change. You know, it's interesting in Romans 10, 9, it says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know what's interesting about that? I think the devil would say to that, every part of that, I agree with that. So obviously, when the passage says you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, this belief is more than just a, yes, Jesus, I believe that you are God. Yes, Jesus, I believe that you should be worshiped. But this is more than just an intellectual assent to something it must result in a change in our lives, in a realignment of our priorities, in something that humbles our hearts and something that transfers our trust from ourselves to him. So let me pause here for a moment and just ask you a couple of questions. If someone was to ask you what it means to not believe the same way the devil does, how would you describe the differences of belief? And secondly, how do you see the devil's system of belief played out in our culture? Well, let's wrap this up with really our last point, and that is there's an exchange that happens here. And, and, and really, this is one of those where were you moments. Where were you when this happened? 
Because, and so in this case, where were you when Jesus cast out this demon into 2,000 pigs and they run off into the lake and they drown themselves? I mean, that was a, that was a huge event. Now, you've got to remember that there was 400 years of silence in between the Old Testament and the New Testament where you didn't hear a whole lot from the heavens. And you, you can imagine also that the demons never take their time off, so they're probably still torturing people and different things during that time. So at this point, when Jesus comes on the scene and he's able to have power over demons, you can just imagine how this was ushering in something new, something that was like, wow, this is incredible. We haven't seen or heard of this in a huge thing in, in a long time. This is a huge sign that's going on. And, and what's interesting, you know, the Jews really didn't care as much about the pigs. They, they, don't, they don't eat them anyway, and nor would they buy them. But in the Gentile world, this was a huge loss. 2,000 pigs? That's a lot of money. And it so devastated the, the, the Gentile region there that they asked Jesus to actually leave. And what's interesting is the man that Jesus set free. They came, they saw him, he was in his right mind, he was clothed, they saw the difference. And when Jesus was going to leave, this man begged Jesus, take me with you. To which Jesus said, go home to your own people. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he did. And the people were amazed. So really, I mean, what this is saying to us is the more that we understand how much God has changed our life and what he's done for us, the more natural it will be for us to want to tell others about it. Now look, I don't know too many people, if I don't know anybody, that has, the, uh, has quite a dramatic story as what this guy has in Mark 5. I mean, that, that's a story. That, that's a, I was lost and now I'm found. You know, my story was more, you know, I was r- raised in a religious background, but I thought, you know, kind of played it safe a lot of my life and had my own idols and different things. And so mine looked more like, you know, um, I thought I was good and I thought God owed me something because I was good. Uh, which was just as bad and until he let me know just how deeply my sin ran in my life and just how deeply I needed him. So it can be from different places, but we all have a story. And God has a story and we've been set free. If you've been set free in Christ, you have a story and God will want you to be able to tell that story to others. Satan will want you to say, be quiet. Don't tell anybody about it. Let's render you ineffective. Oh, you're too scared. What are they going to say? All those things. And and again, he's a liar. And so he'll lie and he'll lie and he'll lie. And we'll miss out on opportunity after opportunity after opportunity because God has those in store for us. In fact, what's interesting here is this man who lived in the caves, who was bleeding, who was crying out day and night, and was naked, had nowhere to go gets rescued by Jesus. And Jesus really later exchanges places with him. This is the great exchange. Jesus traded places because Jesus then became one who was naked, who was stripped, who was tortured, who was bleeding, who cried out and was eventually buried in a tomb for all of us, for all of us. And so how did Jesus ultimately deal with evil? He did it by absorbing it in on himself. He took it all on himself. He takes all evil on himself. Why? So that eventually he could destroy evil completely without destroying us. He wants to destroy evil forever without it destroying us. And by taking it all on himself, he accomplished that. So it is in Jesus, truly, that evil is defeated in our lives. Do you believe that? Now, I'm not talking about just the way that the devil believes, but, but has it changed you? And, and of course, look, if you have questions here and you don't really know 
uh, and you want more about this, then man, please contact us at info at fellowshipcircy.org or you can email us on the side page there and fill out one of those contact cards. We would love to get back with you. We would love to describe more about how this influences all and, and how we can be changed by him. Look, we're in a war. We're in a war. And in this war, we must believe in Jesus. I mean, transfer our trust to him, not just have this intellectual assent. We can't just have the same belief and the same faith that the devil does. And Jesus exchanged his life for ours. True freedom and victory over evil comes from falling more and more in love with the one who can set you free. Of course, if you, and this morning, you know, as we end, I, I th- Abby has picked a great song for us, I think, to end our worship s- service with, and, and that is the song Breakthrough. So let's, let's go and, and worship and finish our service this morning with Abby. You know what to do from here, fellowship. Go love first. Love you.